Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all once again to the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. My name is Hadley Gamble. I am the senior international correspondent and anchor for CNBC in the region. We're thrilled to be sitting here um, with the Deputy Prime Minister. I'm so excited to see you, sir, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to all of us today. Um, Your Excellency, I want to kick off by asking you about some of the things that we've seen developing in the region over the last month, uh, particularly with regards to Israel, the situation in Gaza. We understand that the Israeli government has now asked the United States for an additional $1 billion in military assistance. They want to replenish Iron Dome. Do you think that that would be a mistake for the United States? Well, uh, first of all, Hadley, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Regarding uh, the recent issues that happened uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, we believe uh, that what what led us to the situation that happened in Gaza uh, is not about really the Iron Dome or about how strong or how resilient uh, are the Israelis, but it's really about the behavior of the Israelis recently in Jerusalem, uh, and mainly the eviction of, of people from Sheikh Jarrah, and then the provocation that happened to uh, the people who are trying to access uh, Al-Aqsa, mainly the Muslim and the Christians. And all this, uh, all this uh, uh, behavior has uh, agitated the people uh, there in the West Bank and in Gaza and led us to uh, this recent round of of violence, which was unfortunate. Uh, We have seen the number of of children who have been killed uh, and innocent people and civilians. We have seen that uh, Gaza has been distracted because of of the recent war. So I think we need to be focused on building peace instead of of just focusing on the resilience of one side of, of the conflict. When you think about that with regards to building peace, um, obviously the narrative over the last year or so has been who amongst the GCC countries will next join the Abraham Accords. We saw the UAE and Bahrain uh, leading the charge there. Do you think, given the events of the last several weeks, that that decision was premature? Well, we cannot judge if the decision is premature or or it's uh, uh, mature enough for that. What we see from our perspective uh, in Qatar, which I can comment on, that uh, the main reason for us not to have a relation with Israel is the occupation of of the Palestinian territories. And the reason is still there, they're still valid. And there is no any step or any hope toward peace yet. We didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, back in the 90s, when uh, after Madrid and Oslo, uh, there was some hope that uh, we can probably achieve peace. And Qatar took the first step at that time and opened uh, uh, exchange the trade missions between Qatar and Israel. And we had a relationship until 2008, when the war uh, took place in, in Gaza. So, and then we, we decided to uh, close uh, the offices because we believe that what we have done didn't contribute anything to the peace. Uh, right now, we see that uh, there are principles which uh, there is a consensus around it. One is the Arab Peace Initiative and the Quartet Principles. We believe that if there is a willingness from the Israeli side, uh, which they didn't demonstrate uh, in, in the last decades, uh, I think there, there should be a good starting point from there to have to recognize a uh, Palestinian state, and then the, all, all the Arabs can uh, get along and have a relation with Israel. So uh, it's, not, uh, you know, it's not really about individual countries making a relation with Israel that's going to solve uh, the entire conflict. I believe we should address the conflict first for us, uh, at least from our perspective in Qatar. Then we take the step to have the peace with the Israelis. When you think about that, obviously the politics in Israel uh, have been quite fractious over the last couple of years. I think I've covered maybe four elections in, in, in less than three years, actually. Um, and now you have a new prime minister there. Are you concerned? that Naftali Bennett might not be the best placed person uh, to make a peace? 
Well, we cannot, uh, you know, comment on something unknown uh, until now. Uh, there is a coalition that we uh, heard about that they are, they are going to form a government, but they, they didn't sworn in yet, so no one knows what will happen in the next few days if uh, there is any changes in, in, in the dynamics over there. What we want, we want to uh, see a government that uh, have a vision for uh, a Palestinian state, have a vision to take some serious steps toward uh, peace and stop taking any action that provoke the Palestinians. And uh, uh, especially uh, Jerusalem, which is very sensitive for everyone, for uh, Muslim, Christian walls, for everyone. Uh, we believe that uh, any uh, behavior that will reflect, uh, you know, new settlements, uh, those like uh, what they call the settler societies, activities that, uh, which led to the eviction of Sheikh Jarrah, will not help, will be counterproductive and will keep us in, in these circles, which is, uh, uh, you know, one day you have violence, another day you have ceasefire, uh, then you have some calm period and then again and again and again. I think we need to have uh, uh, you know, a government that leading, uh, leading a process toward achieving the peace by recognizing the Palestinian states on the 1967 borders with Eastern Jerusalem as the capital. Countless U.S. administrations have attempted peace in the Middle East. At the moment, it seems that uh, the Biden administration is content with what they're calling soft diplomacy as they focus um, quite closely on the Iranian file. Obviously, Qatar has been willing in the past to um, facilitate discussions between the Taliban and the United States, NATO partners, also, of course, with Hamas. Do you see a role for Qatar to play in achieving peace and a two-state solution? Well, uh, looking, you know, first of all, Qatar has been uh, a trusted partner for peace and security in the region, and we've been facilitating and mediating between different conflicting parties uh, regarding Iran and, and uh, the U.S. It's in our interest, not only in Qatar, but in the GCC, to have uh, a deal between them, uh, to have a deal that also uh, stopping the nuclear race that's happening in, in, uh, in our region. Uh, it's in our interest not to see, not to have any escalation between uh, the U.S. and Iran. U.S is a strategic uh, ally for Qatar, and we want to maintain this strategic alliance. But, and Iran, from the other hand, is our next door neighbor. And we, do, we want to see stability over there. Uh, facilitating between them uh, is something that if Qatar will be asked by both parties, we will definitely do. Right now, we are just conveying the message for both parties to uh, you know to be more uh, positive and more constructive in engaging with each other and to reach a deal as soon as possible when you think about that with regards to um, what the United States would consider US designated terror organizations we're talking about Hezbollah we're talking about Hamas Taliban as well um, in the past when you think about that with regards to your own foreign policy um, you're willing as you say, to um, help facilitate conversations between all parties. Does that put you at odds with your U.S. counterparts? Well, uh, look, it's, uh, uh, we respect each country designation regime, which, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it applies to, to our rules and regulations, and sometimes it doesn't apply to our rules and regulation. For example, uh, you know, some of the de designated parties was Taliban, uh, and the U.S. at the end of the day needed uh, to talk to them to end this conflict. And it's better for the U.S. to have a friend to talk to their adversaries and their opponents rather than talking to uh, their opponents through other adversaries. So I believe uh, this has been proven that's beneficial for everyone. It's uh, having a contact and, and uh, uh, keeping, uh, maintaining this open channel with different parties is for the benefit of, of the regional security and, and stability. And this is what Qatar is aiming for. It's not, uh, it's not about you know, having a contact or having a relation. It doesn't mean supporting or uh, even believing in the same principles and ideologies. So there's 
a clear distinction between uh, uh, those two elements. Uh, a contact is just to help to promote peace and stability. A contact, because we believe in Qatar that there's no conflict will end uh, militarily. All the conflicts is, are going to end diplomatically. And just to set the record straight, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding um, Qatar in the last several years, whether it be with regards to the GCC um, conflict in terms of the blockade or in terms of supporting Hamas or um, radical elements, perhaps, in, in Gaza. Can you just set the record straight in terms of terror financing? Um, because at this point, you have even Israelis you know, accusing Qatar of funding terrorist elements in their country. Well, uh, this is uh, unfortunately this is part of, of the misinformation com uh, you know campaign that Qatar been uh, subject to. Uh, our aid and our funds going directly to the people, and there are very tight mechanisms which everyone knows, whether it's the Israelis or, or the US. We are complying with uh, all the international rules. We are complying also uh, with uh, with the US. Uh, sanction regime because uh, we are picked to the dollar at the end of the day, and our banking system is is operating, uh, you know, uh, with with the transparency and governance and 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 compliance. Our relation uh, with Hamas or or with uh, Taliban doesn't mean that we are financing them or supporting them. Uh, uh, the relation is to have a contact, to have an open channel with them, and we are helping the people. For example, uh, in Gaza, which we have seen now a lot of misinformation, unfortunately led by, by the Israelis. And the Israelis' party, they know very well how tight is the process of Qatar and where are the funds that Qatar is, is uh, contributing and donating to the people in Gaza going. Uh, since 2012, uh, Qatar has contributed 1.4 billion US dollars to the reconstruction of Gaza. We built around 42,000 housing units over there. We have built roads, hospitals, schools. Uh, we are contributing uh, to sustain those facilities. And none of that when, money has found its way into the pockets of? Of course, it's, it's a very tight process that all the materials, all the contracts is done through our uh, reconstruction committee. We have our people there on the ground. They are working themselves. Now, in the last three years, if we take them as an example, uh, Gaza uh, had the electricity only for two hours at the beginning. And when Qatar stepped in, we increased uh, uh, the time span from two hours to 16 hours. Where we are getting this fuel from? We are getting it get from the, the Israeli side and is going to uh, the electricity company, which belongs to the, the Palestinian Authority. And they generate power for the people in Gaza. This is 50% of the funds uh, that we contribute monthly uh, to Gaza. The other 50% goes to 130,000, the poorest family in Gaza. Each family gets $100. And I have the big question here. Is the $100 the one which is going to build, uh, to finance Hamas or to build for them uh, their weapon system or whatever uh, they are claiming? And uh, another part of the fund, it goes to the UNDP for the Cash for Work program. And we are working in full alignment with the, with the UN. We have uh, a clear uh, coordination mechanism with our international partners. And we've been calling and inviting all the international partners to come in since in the last three years. There was no one except Qatar and some few countries. Gaza needs a lot. They are, you know, uh, it's like an open prison for 14 years. They are like sieged population, 2.1 million people. They cannot move. Do you think that the recent round of media coverage, particularly in the West, um, perhaps is going to shed light on the situation in a way that we haven't seen before? In terms of the shift in media coverage that we've seen of this most recent um, conflict in Gaza, do you see that the media coverage is different in the West in a way we haven't seen before? Well, uh, there is something here. I think that uh, people realize that uh, what happened in Sheikh Jarrah and the eviction of, of the people over there, uh, it looks like an ethnic cleansing and uh, the provocation on Al-Aqsa. 
uh, unfortunately, some of, of the media has, has shifted from the main root cause to what happened later uh, between Gaza and Israel. And they just you know, minimize the conflict uh, to be between Hamas and the Israelis, while the conflict is spreaded everywhere over there. Maybe there is some uh, uh, improvement in, in some of the coverage, but still uh, the dominating narrative over there that it is a war between a small group of the Palestinian people and uh, the Israelis, while the reality is different. The conflict is between the Palestinian peoples who are living under occupation and which they don't have a state yet, and another state with a strong military. I want to ask you uh, a bit more broadly about the region in terms of the foreign policy element. Syria, uh, Bashar Assad has just been re-elected um, as the leader of that country. There have been a lot of conversations about whether or not we could see Syria rejoining the Arab League after years of this conflict. Obviously, you're chairing the Arab League at the moment. Do you anticipate um, Syria coming back into the fold? In the well, near term, uh, we've been we've been you know uh, going through this question for a long time now, and there are uh, a lot of talks about bringing Syria back to the Arab League since in the last two years, and there are some countries within the Arab League are asking and supporting for such a thing. Our main uh, question is what was the cause uh, for suspending Syria from the Arab League? Uh, I think the cause still valid. There are still uh, 6.7, I think, million refugees outside and more than 6 million also internally displaced uh, Syrian people. And uh, still there is uh, uh, a conflict ongoing between the people and, and the Syrian regime. So why we are now changing our position since we took this position back in, in, uh, in 2011 or 2012 by suspending uh, the Syria, and now we want them back. What is uh, uh, what the regime did uh, to bring them back, to award them to be back in the Arab League? I think that if there are serious steps for a political settlement in Syria, then this, this thing should be considerable from our perspective. In other. So you think it's a mistake to reopen diplomatic relations with Syria at this point? Um. Well, it's each country sovereign decision. Uh, Qatar, my country, which I'm talking, uh, you know, on behalf of, uh, we don't intend to open uh, diplomatic relations as long as the cause is, is ongoing. Nothing is changing yet. If there, if there is a political progress for a settlement, then we can consider our options. The UAE has described itself to me through various conversations as wanting to be a major influencer in the region and elsewhere, whereas Saudi Arabia, the regional behemoth, the biggest economy, um, has often directed GCC policy in the past. What is the role of Qatar, do you think? Well, I think if uh, looking at the GCC, uh, you know, uh, the six countries can complement each other in stabilizing the region. And I think that uh, if you will uh, look at our region, the GCC, those six countries, has been the stabilizing factor of, of this uh, region. Uh, now, uh, UAE picking for itself to be a soft influencer in the region, this is something uh, good to be influencing for peace and security, and this is what we are uh, aiming for. Uh, Saudi will remain a very important country. It is the largest country in the GCC. It has Mecca and Al Medina, and it is the largest economy. Qatar, uh, also blessed with uh, natural resources and uh, with uh, a leadership and vision to uh, be a trusted uh, peace and security partner uh, in, in the region. We've been a facilitating uh, country, mediating country between different uh, conflicted parties. And we prove our success since decades. It's not, it's not something new for, for Qatar, and we are continuing toward this. Beyond the GCC, though, when we talk about failed states, obviously we have the situation um, in Palestine, we have the situation in Syria, and now you have Lebanon yeah. um, in the, the middle of a political and economic crisis that is ongoing, and unfortunately so there's no signs of letting up. Can the Middle East afford another failed state in Lebanon? 
in uh, another failed state in the region. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we have, you know, uh, there are countries who are, uh, which are now in, in a bottleneck uh, stage, like Libya, for example, uh, which we believe, you know, maybe after the, when the election takes place, they will go to uh, stabilizing stage. Uh, Iraq, hopefully, uh, now, you know, after the war, uh, they, uh, you know, against, against ISIS, has been trying to reform some of the laws now. They are looking, and, you, know, as, uh, you know, also after the protest that took place last year, now the prime minister is trying to arrange for the upcoming election. We hope that Iraq also will come up with uh, a national unity uh, election, not a sectarian uh, election. But uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, of the Arab countries right now, they are either in the graduation stage to be uh, stabilized or fragile, you know, uh, for example, Sudan. Uh, you know, it's also, uh, there are some small steps as a progress, but they have a lot of challenges as well. And now adding to uh, the economic challenges that they have, there are some geopolitical challenges that they are suffering from. I wanted to ask you that before we move on to the investment uh, picture. Uh, when you think about this with regards to obviously the United States working diligently with the Biden team trying to find a deal with Iran, you look at this um, with regards to the region itself. A few years ago, we started talking about the rise of a Shia crescent from Tehran to Damascus uh, to Lebanon. Obviously, uh, right now in Lebanon, as a result of that economic crisis, as you know, the only people able to get dollars into that country are Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. Does it worry you? Well, of course, uh, the situation in Lebanon is worrying everyone. We don't want to see a collapsed uh, country. Lebanon is, is very important and it's very in very dangerous situation. Unfortunately, uh, the political parties over there, they are not uh, agreeing to form any government. Now, uh, the central bank, I think, will, will stop uh, funding the government uh, very soon. And the government will end up with no budget. And there are a lot of uh, poor families over there who are relying a lot on the subsidies of the government, on the programs of the, on the social support that they are getting from the government. Uh, uh, we are trying our best. The, uh, France is trying its best, but we didn't see any outcome yet. Uh, our advice always to the Lebanese, uh, you have to put your uh, differences and disagreements behind your back now and uh, look forward for the people. But unfortunately, we didn't see any serious steps yet taken by, by the political parties. What worries you more in the Iran nuclear negotiations? The path to um, nuclear enrichment or the second track of those conversations, which is to contain Iran's malign activities in the region? Well, I think right now the conversation is really about uh, the nuclear program. Uh, our vision in, in, uh, in the state of Qatar, which has been stated by His Highness the Emir several times, is to have a, a, a regional security framework between and a regional dialogue between Iran and the GCC to address the concerns that Iran has against the GCC or the GCC has against Iran. I think that uh, the nuclear is very important uh, part of, of the agreement and to stop the nuclear race and the enrichment in our region is, is very important and critical. And, uh, you know, having a nuclear uh, uh, enrichment facilities and or nuclear race in, in, in our region is going to affect the global security, not only, uh, you know, the, the regional security. But uh, what's related to uh, the political, uh, uh, you know, uh, political front of, of that, which is mainly uh, the regional uh, activities that, you know, and the disagreements that we have between ourselves and, and Iran, we believe it will be only solved by, by a dialogue and a dialogue between the GCC uh, and Iran uh, directly. And I think there will be. Uh, good opportunity if we will, if we are going to start on building on our common interest. I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, common things that we can build up for the prosperity of our region and for the Iranian people as well. So our advice to our neighbors uh, in the GCC or 
put our neighbors in Iran is to uh, let us sit around the table and put our concerns on that table and build on our uh, common interest. And you're talking to them now, Tehran? We are, we are in a continuous conversation with them, of course, uh, and uh, they have been very receptive to the idea of, of the regional uh, dialogue. Also with our GCC uh, partners, there is uh, some a sort of, of understanding for the need for this regional dialogue. It's probably about the time for, for this regional dialogue when it's going to take place. But it's very important to take place, and we believe it's important that we have the leadership of, of such a dialogue and not leave it for other countries. Uh, we appreciate and respect the U.S., uh, the P5 country, uh, to be you know, uh, part of this, uh, to be a supporter for this. But the core of, of this dialogue should be handled by the GCC and the Iran. What's really exciting often uh, when I speak to officials is um, when one of them allows me to talk both politics and business, because so often business leaders yeah. and those who, those who run sovereign funds try to tell me that politics and business don't mix, and we all know that isn't true. So it's very exciting to be able to speak to you on the diplomacy side, but also uh, in your role at the QIA and as Deputy Prime Minister. I want to ask you about the investment situation today. Obviously, one of the big conversations and themes of this forum has been rising inflation. The world is awash with cash. Where do you deploy it? Um, and, and worries, frankly, each country is specific about what central banks have to do um, in terms of that rising inflation, in terms of rates. How do you see the economic outlook today? Well, we believe that uh, the pandemic has changed the landscape uh, of the global economy and it created a lot of opportunities and it ended some of uh, uh, the businesses which was uh, rising you know, in, in, in the previous years. For our uh, mandate as a QIA, uh, we are very much focused on diversifying our economy. So it means that going away, uh, creating an alternative source from the hydrocarbon. So we have our natural resources, which is run uh, by uh, Qatar Petroleum, and QIA is the arm that should help the government and support the government to substitute the hydrocarbon for the future generation. And we are very much focused on uh, sustained, sustainable investments, whether it's in technology, in infrastructure, in education, in healthcare. And those sectors, uh, you know, prevailed even uh, during uh, the pandemic. And one important element that we are uh, looking uh, at is uh, to apply it to our matrix, which should have an economic impact for the country that we are investing in and for Qatar, a social impact for the country that we are investing in, and environmental impact for, uh, for the globe. So uh, we are very much focused and determined. And uh, even with the, with the pandemic, I believe most of the sovereign wealth fund has done very well in terms of investment in the last year. Uh, and uh, we hope that we continue uh, we continue like this, and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's very it's very important to keep our strategy dynamic, given uh, the change in the dynamics in the world is, is is getting much faster than than before. Absolutely. When you think about this, I'm um, specific to the QIA's investments. How important is the technology and and digital um, asset? class to you guys, because at this point, um, we've seen over the last year or so, particularly with COVID-19, such a rise in all of the technology stocks. We talk about the FANGs on a daily basis at CNBC. How important is it uh, in terms of your asset allocation? Well, it has been very important uh, even before, uh, before, before the pandemic. Uh, uh, historically, QIA was very much focused on financial services, real estates, and those traditional assets. But in the last few years, we have redirected our strategy being focused on technology, on education. For example, online education. We've been investing in online education since 2018. And suddenly, when the pandemic you know, happened to us, uh, we saw those companies are becoming uh, targeted companies for, for a lot of investors. Uh, uh, for us, uh, technology and digitization is a very important element, and we believe also 
it's uh, going along with the infrastructure for those technology to be invested. And then we have seen an expansion in, in, in the investment of the, infra in the telecom like infrastructure. The infrastructure, the data centers, yeah. the telephone yes. towers, and that kind of um, investment. When you think about that with regards to what we are seeing out, playing out right now, obviously I had an interview earlier this week with the central bank governor of Russia, and we talked about the future of digital currencies. Um, she was talking about the development of that in China. They're developing one as a prototype here in Russia. There could potentially be one coming out of Iran in the near term. Do you see digital currencies? Well, uh, look, it's, uh, it's really a dilemma, I think, right now. It's still, it's still unclear. If you have a currency that's not backed up with the product, you, you are still going to be suspicious about it. So in, for us, uh, as, as a sovereign wealth fund, we look very carefully in uh, how risky is the investment that we are doing. Because uh, we believe that we are managing the funds for our children and our grandchildren, for the next generations to come, not for ourselves to enjoy a short-term profits. Uh, digital currency is still unclear. Uh, there, there is no certainty uh, about it. Maybe in the coming years it will be strengthened. Maybe it will be something that uh, you know will be more popular and and uh, will get much better value and uh, this is will be good for the early investors but uh, we would rather have you know uh, less return but being on a solid ground than having you know a high return so no plans to get into fragile. cryptocurrencies anytime soon Pardon? so no tr plans to get into the crypto space uh, anytime soon i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> when you think about what happens next with regards to that sort of um, investment allocation mm -hmm. what do you see as the makeup of the qia over the next 10 years are we talking about more of a digital asset play? Are we talking about traditional real estate? What looks attractive to you? Well, uh, our aim is to have a balanced portfolio in real estate, financial services, and technology, and in entertainment uh, infrastructure, and healthcare and education. Uh, so, uh, because we've been focusing uh, very much on financial services and real estate at, uh, at the beginning, right now we are investing mainly in infrastructure and in, uh, technology and healthcare and, and education. So it's not uh, it's not really something that we are uh, you know uh, redirecting or, or giving more attention just to the technology right now. But we are very much diversified because diversification in terms of sector and geography is key for us. COVID-19 obviously has put a, a, a dent in world travel, to say the least. There are a lot of conversations right now about the health of airlines. Um, Qatar Airways obviously doing actually quite well against the backdrop of this pandemic, adding destinations, as we recently heard, um, unlike other airlines. When you think about what happens next with regards to your tourism portfolio, obviously the World Cup is coming up. How do you see this impacting what you're trying to do there? Because at the end of the day, it requires a lot more um, in terms of manpower uh, with the COVID-19 restrictions and how things are going to open up going forward. What does that look like to you? Well, I think that uh, you know people will not stop traveling. Will not stop. You know, uh, you will not stop having uh, tourists. And uh, you have seen this is a demonstration here in, in St. Petersburg. There are a lot of people. There is a crowd, and everyone you know wants to this pandemic to end as soon as possible, and they want to come to go back to their normal uh, life. There, there was an impact on, on the hospitality business, uh, especially on the airline business because of, uh, because of the pandemic. But we believe it needs a year or two to pick up again. For the World Cup, uh, we believe that uh, Qatar is ready and prepared for to host the World Cup. Uh, even uh, until now, we are uncertain with the pandemic and how the vaccination will be ongoing. But we are preparing also uh, an alternative plans to make sure that the people who are arriving uh, for the World Cup are vaccinated and are tested so they can have uh, the maximum experience uh, they wish to see in the World Cup. And we believe that the World Cup will be the first uh, very happy celebration of, of the people after two years of lockdown. So uh, we are very much focused on delivering an amazing World Cup. When I arrived in Moscow, it was um 
quite clear to me that given the restrictions in, in um, the UK and elsewhere right now, if you're coming from the UAE or coming from Qatar or coming from Saudi Arabia, it's a bit more difficult to get into some of our favorite destinations. But when I arrived in Moscow, I felt just at home because every one of my flight, it was a packed flight. So there were a lot of com people coming from the UAE, a lot of people coming from Qatar. I saw some Saudis. Um, how quickly do you think uh, given the fact that Qatar, um, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia, for example, have done so well in their vaccination programs. Are we going to see London opening up once again um, to tourists from this part of the world? What's going to happen in that space? Because obviously this is an ongoing conversation, I know, between airline leaders, also, of course, governments. Where are we in those conversations? Well, well uh, for us, we are uh, talking to the countries which are in lockdown right now. We are following up with them, how is the situation over there. And uh, we believe that in the next few months, uh, when the vaccination uh, campaign has reached the levels that they are uh, aiming for, uh, it will be open. So uh, we hope that you know by the end of 2021, most of the world will be vaccinated and the travel will, restriction will be lifted. But no one knows. You know, uh, there has been always some surprises, new variants, uh, new things. But let's hope for the best. 2032. There's a plan at this point, and you want to host, you're saying, the Paralympic Games, but also the Olympic Games. That's a big step, and something, though, very much in line with what we've seen in terms of plans over the last 10 years or so. The World Cup, everybody at the time, when this started being discussed globally, there were a lot of raised eyebrows about whether or not Qatar could handle the World Cup. Now you're talking about the Olympic Games. Well, uh, right now we are uh, in what called the continuous dialogue with the Olympic, with the OIC, the Olympic International uh, Committee. So we cannot commit uh, comment much on the bid itself. But uh, what we are uh, uh, planning for is something totally aligned with Qatar National Vision and also with the United Nations SDG. And there has been. Uh, significant investment already in place for the World Cup and infrastructure uh, being built for uh, for the country. So we will be very much focused on delivering a sustainable, environmental, friendly, economic impact, uh, social impact uh, Olympics. And uh, it's uh, we see that uh, uh, the region has been uh, like deprived from from uh, those big events like the World Cup and and the Olympics. And uh, Qatar is, is trying to uh, take this opportunity and bring this to the region because we be we believe that will benefit uh, the entire region. And as we have proven uh, a, a track record uh, with hosting successful sports events now for for a long time since 2006 Asian Games and all the championships after that and hoping and aiming for the World Cup in 2022, I think Qatar proves that it is capable to host a world-class event like the Olympic. So we're talking about world-class events. We're talking about um, being the region's negotiator, if you will. Um, when you take a seat back and, and just sort of think about what's happened in, in the region over the last five years, it seems as if, to an outside observer, that the GCC blockade of Qatar didn't really hurt so much Qatar as the rest of the GCC. Well, it's uh, actually, you know, uh, let me call it an unfortunate event that took place and fractured the GCC for a while. Uh, we are looking, uh, you know, we want to overcome uh, this issue, uh, but also learning from the experience that we've been through. The GCC uh, fractured in, in, in those uh, four years. And uh, what we have missed in terms of cooperation together is a lot for our people. So right now, I think we need to safeguard and focusing on safeguard the GCC from getting fractured in the future, uh, building a positive and constructive relationship with our neighbors, and building on common interest. Uh, there is a lot of areas that we can build on between us and the other GCC countries between our people that can safeguard us and build a strong foundation for the future not to be vulnerable for any, uh, for any conflict. Uh, I think uh, you know, any country uh, has gone through uh, a crisis. Uh, 
either uh, you know they remain as that score they get weaker or they get stronger and in Qatar we built our resilient and we built for ourselves a solid ground to be stronger in the future would you say that Qatar has buried the hatchet with Saudi Arabia and the UAE at this point but buried the hatchet what's that put the problems to bed well, uh, look, uh, it's uh, it's a very sensitive issue. So, uh, because what, Al Jazeera is still on the air. Yeah, wh why we should shut down Al Jazeera? Well, that was one of the no. The conflict, the, the, the conflict was something different. Uh, I'm sorry to say that, but uh, look, uh, it is very sensitive issue. What happened uh, has, you know, created uh, a scar uh, in, in the GCC. It needs some time to heal, but uh, we are positive. We see our BCC partners are positive also. And we should look for the future. We are a forward-looking country. We want to build a friendly relationship with everyone. Uh, I mean, uh, the GCC, uh, in terms of, of uh, community between, between the countries, is much more than the differences. So let us focus on this and let us build on this. And the differences, it doesn't matter to be there. It doesn't matter to have a dialogue around it and to reach an agreement, uh, hopefully, one day. Uh, but I think that uh, what we see, uh, there's a new page in the GCC. We are optimistic about it. And we hope also that the other countries, what we see actually from them, that they are optimistic about it and they want to uh, seek for better cooperation in the future. Your Excellency, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you.